Hi, this is Susie Marshmuffin, LCSW, that's Licensed Clinical Social Worker. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Recovery Addictions and uh, Mental Health. And I would like to share with you a couple of the uh, techniques I used when I was in early recovery in order to um, get through the first couple of stages. Now, the first stage, almost everyone thinks the job and therapy is to not feel anything. Actually, what we're doing way before we come to therapy is we learn how not to feel. And I've used this example before. My mother had always confided in me when I was probably starting at age eight or nine, maybe even seven. She would confide in me how she felt about our dad and how um, she felt about other things and how frustrated she was and she usually was depressed. And so it was a big burden, burden for me. So I remember at about age 13 or 14, we were riding down the road in the car and I was sitting next to her and I said, mom, a friend of mine told me that her mom always talks to her and that she had to ask her to stop because it was hard or something like that. And I will never forget that she became enraged. Now she's driving, she didn't do anything, she just became very angry. And what I got from that was my mother who told us all, all five of us children, don't ever lie to me. The most important thing you can do is always tell me the truth. And I thought, that's right, I am not gonna tell her the truth anymore because look what happened. I basically got rejected and then sort of abandoned because she was so mad she didn't speak to me for a while. So that's a horrible feeling if you went through that in your childhood. Being abandoned is a very difficult feeling for a kid or a teenager. So I remember distinctly when I made that decision. I don't remember other decisions that I made. Um, I usually have to nowadays just really think about uh, behavior and the first time it appeared. I had um, another behavior that started happening when we moved here, here to Melbourne and we would go out, Jim and I loved to dance, so we would go out dancing usually on a weekend and I started having this very strange attitude. I would be just negative and angry as soon as we got to the club and just either not want to dance or just just so nasty. And finally, he got sick of it and I got sick of it and I started thinking about two things. I remembered when I was in college, for some reason, when um, I would go into a bar, now I probably was at the early stages of my own addiction and my AD, worse ADHD. And so what would happen is we'd go to a bar, my friends and I, and I would slam into people. Of course, the bars were this crowded. All of them were on campus at the University of Alabama, of course, when that's when um, Roll Tide and Bear Bryant was there. So anyway, we'd go to a bar, they were this crowded. I would knock into men on purpose, just getting my anger out. And I would wonder while I was doing it, why would I do that? So I remembered that episode, which continued for probably four to six years. And then this time I decided I needed to go back further because that remembering that episode didn't really help me stop acting out my own anger. And I remembered that when my dad would take my mother out on a date or they had to go to a party for his work or something, that she would run through the house, not run, but she would be through the house getting ready, slamming things, cussing, being upset that she had to go. But when she came home, she was very happy. And so my dad would always say, well, once she gets there, she'll be happy. And so it was true. But the only piece that I picked up from that was to be negative and deep down, I wanted Jim to have a bad experience because I, for some reason, which I couldn't say until I figured it out, was having a bad experience. But really, it's like my favorite thing to do is dance. So that's not really what I wanted, but I was recreating that experience over and over and over. And if you think about your life and you say, I don't want to have what's going on in my life, I will promise you that you do want to have what's going on in your life. If you're in a situation, and I'm not talking about being a battered woman and you want to be battered, I'm talking about being in situations 
where uh, you keep pushing people away and you're upset about not having friends, where you can't be intimate with your partner, but you feel like you're not close at all, but you're the one not opening up. So for most of us, there's these defenses that we learn, like I said, when I learned them, and they're, they make a big impact on us. And uh, the first one, the biggest impact was that one when we're riding in the car and she immediately became furious with me. That one didn't leave for probably until the last few years of um, in recovery. I didn't act my anger out, and, but I did start remembering it and, and what happened when we go out dancing. So it's really, really helpful if you think you don't have issues look at your life is your life really where you want it to be is it what you want spiritually is it what you want mentally is it what you want psychologically and uh emotionally is it what you want physically what is stopping you and almost always there's some defenses that we learned a long time ago that gave us a belief. And my belief, my mom was extremely important to me. We were very close, too close because she confided in me, but we were very close and I really looked up to her and at that time. And so when she got that angry at me, which she had been before, but never when I confronted her, that was it. I started recreating that in my life at that time. And I started doing drugs, started only hanging out with people that were doing drugs, continued to do drugs until I was about 24, drinking and doing drugs. So uh, that decision was made at an early age. I can't think of any other good examples now um, besides those two. But if you think about it, you have some defenses that keep you locked in a behavior pattern. That is whether you are um, quiet when you need to speak up for yourself and then when you're quiet the results of that probably mean you don't get your needs met and like most of us then we say we're not getting our needs met because of him or her when actually it's because we might not be speaking up for him because it was dangerous to do that it was certainly dangerous for me and let's say you are not satisfied in your career and maybe you haven't pursued what you really want to do. Have you pursued what your heart's path is? What you really want, what you really like? Are you too afraid? I had a friend who was a veterinarian and he always, always wanted to be an artist, but no matter what, he would not stop and take search his life and do what he wanted to do. He really, wanted to do that so badly. Actually, he didn't want to do it. He wanted to stay safe, to step out of being a veterinarian, a very safe job with a lot of money would be very scary to jump out there as an artist. There'd be a way to do it very slowly, um, but why take the risk? It's much easier to blame the fact that you can't do it than taking the risk. It is taking the risk that most of us don't want to do. It is jumping off that cliff. Um, nothing's going to happen except you're going to be scared to death for a while and then you're going to feel proud of yourself and then you're going to take the next risk. The, um, I think the first risk I took was, I didn't, it wasn't a risk for me to get clean and sober because I'd never tried before. I'd never been told I needed to get off drugs. It, I was just went to a pro, uh, meeting with a friend of mine because I got fired. Now that was the first time I got fired and I was a waitress and I thought I need to be in a marketing because I had a marketing degree. So uh, the fact that I got fired for, as a waitress was just appalling to me. So the busboy there took me to a 12 step program for people that want to stop using drugs. So I stopped that day and it was not, I did go through some withdrawal, but it wasn't that hard for me because I just had this feeling I was supposed to do this. And because in the beginning, I did not believe that I had a drug problem or an alcohol problem. Luckily, thank God, I stayed clean and sober while I was going through the early stages of addiction recovery enough to learn that it was uh, definitely my problem. Now, my very first 12-step meeting, and I have to say this story again because it's so important, uh, this woman came up to me and she said, hi, my name is, I'll say Sandy, and I'll be your mentor. So I said, okay, 
what's that? What, what do you what do you mean? She goes, well, I just help you with what we do here. And I said, okay. And she said, tonight, I want you to pray and ask God to keep you clean. I was like, I don't have to ask God to keep me clean. I can do it myself. I said, well, first of all, I'm an atheist. And she said, that's fine. I want you to pray to God and say, I don't believe you exist. If you do, please let me know. And I said, oh, that is the coolest idea. I thought, that is great. And I never doubted that if there was a God, he would somehow let me know. I have no idea, except my brain was probably so messed up from the drugs, acid, marijuana, alcohol, pills, and I used every day. And luckily, it made me so vulnerable, I was willing to try anything. And I wanted to prove to those people that I didn't have a problem. So I said, okay, I'll do that. And um, then at some point, I can't remember, but I think she told me to also ask for a sign about whether or not I had an addiction. So I added that to my prayers. Now, the very first time I said a prayer, I was sitting there on my knees, like she told me to do, and I said, God, I don't believe you exist, but if you do, let me know. The second I said that, my brand new kitten jumped into my lap. I immediately knew it was a sign from God. I knew in my heart and in my soul that I didn't believe I had, that it was a sign from God, and that the kitten represented unconditional love from the kitten to me, from God to me. So I said, okay, God, I believe you are unconditional love. That, I can buy that. Okay, that's that's you. That's your higher, you're my higher power and that's unconditional love the way I hope to have it for my pets. So I went on in the program and probably was going through some withdrawal, but every once in a while, I would feel like there was a hand right behind my shoulder. And sometimes it felt like the hand was on my shoulder and I was so whacked out and depressed and disoriented and coming off of drugs. But every once in a while, I just felt this comforting hand we were in treatment, um, all of us in this daytime treatment program where they would have us meditate. Um, and that was when that first hand started being there during a guided meditation. And then it was so comforting every once in a while it would just be there and it was uh, very lovely and I was very lucky to have that experience. And then I'm um, going to meetings every day and talking in halfway house. My sponsor made me go to halfway house because I was so sick. So I was living in a halfway house and um, it was December 25th and I decided to leave Atlanta and go home for Christmas. And so um, I had gotten a 12-step book for Christmas. So I had that book and I went over to a good friend of mine's house who I still love, but she was one of my drinking buddies in college and her family drank a lot. And so I went over there to be with her. She was there. Her mother was there, her grandmother was there. Now her and her mother are drinking. Grandmother is in a 12-step program for alcohol and um, just smoking her cigarettes, drinking her coffee, very calm, very serene, like a little Buddha. And um, I remember thinking that something was weird about me and I didn't know what it was and I would notice that her name was Dama, that the grandmother Dama would sometimes look at me like she either knew something about me or was just thinking about how I was acting. And I just knew that I had this funny feeling in my stomach and I didn't know what it was. And that I was kind of over laughing a lot and overacting a little bit and I couldn't stop myself. I just was aware of it. And so eventually, um, Dama left to go to bed and I walked her out the door and as I hugged her good night she said remember Susie the steps work and it was ominous when she said it it was this ominous feeling the steps work the 12 step program 12 steps work so I said okay and then shortly after that I went home now when I went home that feeling in my stomach started feeling like a little tree in my stomach, like something was growing there. And then it started getting a little bit bigger, like it was going up to my chest. So I thought I must be hungry. So I opened the refrigerator door in my parents' house 
What do you think I saw? Budweiser. Suddenly, the tree shot up to my throat. It was like this giant tree just was in my body, and I was overjoyed. I said, it's been two months since I had a drink or a drug, and I am craving alcohol, and there's no reason for me to except one. I must be an alcoholic and an addict. And I was overjoyed. I felt like my prayer was answered. It didn't matter that I had this disease. What mattered was God cared enough about me to show me that he was going to answer my prayer. So I got excited. And then I heard Dama's voice in my ears saying the steps work. So I knew I was supposed to go get that 12-step book and look at it and read a little bit from the 12 steps. So I rush upstairs, go to my brother's bedroom. Now this is the brother that died, so it's significant to me and I always slept in there when I could. And I go and I get my book and I open it up to the steps and I read the first step and read a little bit about the first step and I thought, that's it. I totally believe it, I buy it, I understand now after two months and 10 days that I really am an addict. I really am a drug addict and an alcoholic and I have finally no doubt in my mind and I'm smiling and I'm relieved. And then I read the second step. The second step is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I said, I totally buy that now. Now that I know that a higher power is unconditional love, I know that I can be restored to sanity. I haven't used, I'm not gonna use again. Sanity usually means I'm not gonna use again because it's crazy to do that if you really have a problem. So I said, I got that step down, I'm not gonna use again. So then I read the third step. And the third step is, of course now I can't remember it, but it's about turning our lives and our will over to a higher power that we understand. Now my higher power was unconditional love. So I sat there for just a couple of seconds. Who wouldn't want to turn your life and will over to that? And I thought, yes, of course I do. I'm 100% ready. So I said the little prayer that went with that third step prayer and turned my life over and do not remember the next few minutes. I don't know if it was two minutes or three hours. All I know is I went from sitting there on my knees in front of my brother's stereo to laying on the bed, whirling and whirling and swirling in absolute, complete, unconditional love. I felt so much love. It was unbelievable. I mean, I just laid there and just all I did was lay there and lay there and lay there. I don't even remember going to sleep, but I know that when I woke up in the morning, I kind of looked around and it was still there. And I had this funny feeling that I should not tell anybody until years later when I thought I should share it. And when I got in the car that morning, I turned on the ignition and turned on the radio and Blood, Sweat and Tears song about you came and you took control, you touched my very soul, I always knew that loving you was where it's at, you made me so very happy. And that song was God singing to me, I knew it, and it was me singing to God. That song, when I turned on the radio, again, miracle after miracle after miracle, and I felt like God had been with me through my addiction and heard those prayers and gave me the only thing that would have helped me. And many people are much, much more luckier than I am. They have faith without ever having to have those signs. I had to have those signs, and I was so lucky I got them. Um, I still remember those miracles like they were this morning. And I wanted to share that with you because if I hadn't gone to a 12-step meeting, if I hadn't been open to what this woman told me to do and how she told me to pray, it wouldn't have happened. This is Susie Marsh Muffin, LCSW, Licensed Clinical Social Worker. And I just wanted to share that experience with you, how um, prayer can change your life, how a higher power can be the sort of higher power you choose and that the 12-step programs are a great addition to therapy. I really believe in therapy and uh, recovery. So thanks so much for listening. Hopefully I'll see you here next Thursday. Bye-bye.